morning to everyone. We are continuing our study of the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 13 this morning. If you do not have a uh, lesson handout, they're in between the doors on the exit there. I would encourage you to get one of those. Acts chapter 13. Before we start, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Our holy and our awesome God, we come to you uh, with humble hearts, just so thankful that you have allowed us to be here today. That you've allowed us to come before you and worship you. And even in the study, you've allowed us to open your words, and that you've revealed your words, and that we can read them and understand them. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the fact that we can uh, come to you because of him, because of the sacrifice that he gave me, willingly giving himself on the cross. Father, we pray as we uh, study this morning from the book of Acts that we would have hearts that are willing to listen and understand. We would have minds that are willing to apply and to learn. Father, we pray that you would be with all the teachers and all the students in all of our classes this morning. Help everything that is done here to be encouragement uh, to ourselves, most importantly, uh, to be to your praise and your glory. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as I mentioned, we are in the book of Acts, chapter 13. So at the end of our week, uh, last week, at the end of Acts chapter 12, we read of the death of Herod. And it's an interesting way that he dies, right? He listens to the people say, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately he's struck down because he did not give God the glory and he's eaten by worms. Kind of a gruesome way to think about death. And then we come to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 is a, is a pivotal point in the book of Acts. At a superficial level because uh, Saul is begin to be referred to as Paul, as you'll see at the top of your material. But it's also, um, Acts chapter 13 is a recording of uh, Paul's first missionary journey. And so we see the gospel begin to spread in a, in a real sense throughout the known world. It's not just in Jerusalem. It's not just in the, in the area of Judea. It, it begins to spread, and we see that in the book of Acts chapter 13. We're going to start reading in verse 1. Now there were an, in the church in Antioch, so up on the top right here, right? Church of Antioch. Prophets and teachers, Barnabas Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So a couple interesting questions um, that I would put before you. What should we learn from the Holy Spirit's role described here. Up until this point, the Holy Spirit has done what? He's inspired the apostles and given them ability that is, that is not normal, that is not human. But we see something different here. What should we take away from that? Dwayne? There's a divine nature to the Holy Spirit and... There's a goal that he's trying that I use the pronoun he, but there's a there's a goal that the Holy Spirit is trying to accomplish, yep. and he is furthering the the kingdom of God. So again, we see that they work the the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They work harmoniously together, but that there are things which the Holy Spirit has designed and, and have plans for according yep. to God that these men are going to do. Yeah. And we see those plans uh, as we'll read through the rest of uh, chapter 13 this morning. But the fact that the Holy Spirit says, sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit, we think of it in terms of a different context, not physically giving direction. But that's what happened here. There's a direction that's given. I want you to set apart. How can we learn from the 
example of the church at Antioch. So what do we see the church of Antioch doing first? Fasting and praying. There was a specific reason that they were doing that. It wasn't just a flippant thing that they were, that they were doing. What can we take away from that? Dwayne? I think one of the things is, again, you know, when we look at Acts, is the model of how we set our church up and the way we're supposed to act. That I think the idea of fasting can be neglected. You know, and it's one of these things that we see as a New Testament model of members of the New Testament church doing. But I think it's one of those things that, that isn't often done in the year 2016. And we see that a lot of times, well, I did a sermon on this several years ago. Fasting and praying are almost always coupled with it. Sure. Right? It, it's one of those things that when you're praying, that fasting, for lack of a better term, helps to enhance that prayer. It helps to let God know that you know, this is important and I, I'm sacrificing everything else because I want to draw closer to God. And so there's things in there. Uh, again. But we see that they're not taking their responsibilities as Christian. Look, they're, they're devoted by withholding food from their, themselves. They're, they're praying because they want to make sure that what they're doing is coming into the Yeah. When you think about uh, what Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas are setting out to do, is that something we do? We set people off to teach? This doesn't have anything to do with your question. But going back to the Holy Spirit, um, in Acts 2, when Peter was preaching in Jerusalem, you know, to all the people, he told them that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and they left Jerusalem and spread out. And do you think that these people in Antioch came from that Jerusalem uh, time for Peter preaching? And uh, they hadn't received the Holy Spirit until this time? Yeah, so we don't have exactly what it says, right? And so we don't want to assume too much. But it is a logical right thing to think that as Jews from all over the known world come to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and when they separate where do they go they they go back home and so there is probably some some logical assumptions there but it's also logical to assume that some of those people taught right if I'm a Christian I'm going back to my home I'm going to teach everybody else around me and so there's a, a logical indication there when we think about what specifically they were doing. Sending off people to preach. We, as this, as this body, we support men who go all over the world preaching the gospel. How often do we take time to pray and fast over that? I'll ask you yourself that question, as I'll ask myself that question. How often do we take time to do that? Because the, it's, it's not about praying and fasting. That's not the, the purpose. Right? The purpose is, what, what, is the, what are the men pr- trying to accomplish? They're trying to spread the gospel. They're trying to spread God's wonderful news of salvation to everyone. That's something that's worthy of praying and fasting. That's something that's worthy of taking an intentional moment Intentional time to, to sit back and say, this is important, and it needs strong consideration. Uh, Paul and then Ed. Yeah, um, <clears throat> sometimes we've got to be careful. We, we have a tendency to, and I say we, the church as a whole. <coughs> we have a tendency in this century, in this modern times, to look back and say, well, that's how they did it. <coughs> and there's great examples and now we have all this high-tech media, we don't need that no more. Yeah. And sometimes we step out of bounds because we let everybody else do it, or the church per se, if they have elders, let the elders see this and that. We've lost the idea of personal evangelism. Yeah. And back in the, in, in the early church, it was all about personal evangelism. That's right. You know, individuality. Yeah. You know? And sometimes we just cast that off and let everybody else do it. 
you know. We better not miss that point. Right, exactly. That's right. Yeah. And, I, and I think also, um, just to build on that, a lot of times we, we're content that we're, we're just supporting men throughout the world. And we don't really follow it in a connected way. And, you know, like the, in the scriptures point out, we're fellow laborers with those folks when we're supporting them. So, yeah. you know, we should be engaged in what's going on in the Philippines or what's going on in Africa, especially when they're stepping outside their norm and, and, and we try to we you know we try to get that pointed out and we try to read that to the congregation when those things happen. You know, so, yeah. so we can pray. But yeah, we need to be more insightful about keeping that high on our radar. Yeah. In, a, in a more in a much more local sense as well, what about if I'm gonna teach a class to, to students back here? Should I take time in prayer. Absolutely, because it's not something that I'm doing on my own accord. It's not my own ability. It's God's word that we're instructing, that we're teaching, that we're sharing. In verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, right? So if, if you look here at the map, right, Antioch, Seleucia, it's a very short distance. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Barjesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, Barjesus, right? For that is the meaning of the name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And so we see an interesting exchange happen here. Why would a Jewish magician oppose these men, oppose Barnabas and Saul, and seek to turn the proconsul from the faith? Well, I would think that um, this was the God now, and, you know, now he's got some competition. Yeah. When you think of prophets, right, as we've already pointed out uh, in this in this quarter, prophets are what? Messengers. Messengers. And how do you determine if a prophet is a true prophet or a false prophet? It seems about true. Yeah. Listen to them. Does what they say actually happen? And so it's noted here that uh, Barjesus or Elimus is a false prophet. So he's out there saying things that aren't actually happening. And here come these men that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. That are actually saying things that are going to happen and do happen. And so we see a natural reaction, right? He's going to oppose that. He's going to say, well, I, the, the, I'm not, I'm not going to stand for this. When we see the pro right? Seeking to turn the pro away from the truth. The proconsul is an influential person in, in Roman time, right? It's, it's a person in charge of that Roman area. He's going to try and turn that person away from the truth. What do we know about Romans and Christians at this point in time? Right? A lot of friction. Friction would be light in, in, in a way of saying it. Persecution. Putting people to death. And here's an opportunity for a Roman official to listen to the truth and to hear it and respond to it. What type of influence, what type of impact could that have? Right? That's, that's a rhetorical question. We understand that that could have a drastic positive influence and positive impact. And, and so, hey, listen, I'm going to turn you away from that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose it. I'm going to stop you from believing it. But Saul... In verse 9, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And so I've got four questions up here. Why would Paul call him these types of terms? You are a son of the devil. That's, that's a pretty strong accusation. You oppose, you're an enemy of righteousness. 
You will not make you will not stop making crooked the paths of the Lord. Why make this these types of statements? Dave? Because Paul knows that this guy is, is evil. It, it, it's, it's not you know, speculation or sure. his opinion. He knows that this, this guy is, is evil. Yeah. And, and he takes advantage to point it out. I, mean, I think the, the pro-counsel calls him a man of intelligence. He, he probably suspected that there was some shenanigans going yeah. on here. He wasn't dumb. That's right. And so now he's hearing the other side of the story, and I can make it more of an uh, in, you know, engaged, intelligent decision about yeah. what the truth really is. That's a good point. So if you're, if you're an intelligent person and you hear something that's foolish, your ears are automatically perked up. Like something about this just doesn't add up, right? We've all, we've all experienced that type of thing. Mary Beth? Well, the, the four statements he makes about um, that Elimas is are the, are the four characteristics we see in other passages about Satan. So he's he's just listing. You you have the characteristics of your father, and um, you know, because we we all already know that Satan is the father of all lies. He's yeah. full of deceit and um, his. You know, his violent, treacherous arrows. So he's just listing the, the same characteristics yeah. that we see over and over about Satan. As a side point, it's amazing when you look at Scripture, when you look at the New Testament, and how everything just connects together. And so, as Mary Beth pointed out, when you hear and you read about someone like Elimus being called the son of the devil, it's because the same things are said about the devil. And when you, when you just stop for a moment and consider the New Testament, not being some mythical book that a bunch of guys got together and wrote some stuff down. This is inspired. It is, it is not logically possible that a bunch of different people could come together and write things down and they all say the same thing. And just the way everything is weaved together, we shouldn't miss that point. In verse 10, and, be, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. So Paul is speaking to Elimus. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. And so we see him immediately struck with blindness. When you think about him being a false prophet, how ironic is it that he's the one that's told this is going to happen and it actually happens immediately. And so he has to seek people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. The intelligent proconsul believes. When he saw the, what, what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And so when we think about the immediate effects of Elimus being struck blind. It wasn't for Paul's own ego, his personal satisfaction that, well, if you're going to pose me, I'm just going to strike you blind and just go away. It's not the point. The point is exactly what happened, which is the proconsul sees that and he believes because he's astonished at what is happening. He's an intelligent person, able to reason and to understand. When we think about us today, we're not asking, the Bible is not asking for us to believe something that's far-fetched and illogical. The Bible wants us to, God wants us to read and understand what we're reading. He wants us to comprehend. We are intelligent people and we're, we're fully capable of understanding that. And we shouldn't miss that point. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. And they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. So we see the journey that's, that's, that's being made here. 
After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. This is amazing. When you think about the rulers of the synagogue, the Jewish people, saying, if you've got encouragement for us, say it. This is a stark contrast to what we've read so far in the book of Acts about how the rulers of the Jewish synagogue responded. They haven't said, hey, if you've got encouragement, come say it. The impact that is made on the apostles, on Paul and Barnabas spreading the word. And so when they've told him to to say the encouragement, he stands up and motioning with his hands says, men of Israel and you who would fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during the stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave, he gave him the judges until Samuel the prophet. So he's restating what they know. This isn't the first time we've seen a restating to the people. Peter does it in Acts chapter 2. We, we see the same type of thing. And it really should impress upon us that Paul is meeting them where they're at. They know and they understand these things. And so I'm going to get on the same page as you, right? I'm going to share things that we're, we're both in agreement of. Then they asked for a king. So the, the, the children of Israel asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in, the, in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he has promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all of the people of Israel. And so he's bringing them further along. He's bringing them closer to the reality that they need to hear. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? John the Baptist. I'm not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. We see the quote there because it's, it's what he says in, as we can read in the, in the Gospels. Sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. Now it begins to get personal. This isn't some mythical story. This is something that you should know. You can read in the Old Testament. You're taught every Sabbath day about the coming Messiah. The Messiah that is going to come, that is going to fulfill all the promises that we can read in the prophets. And this has happened. We see it for certainty. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. They found in him no guilt worthy of death. Who's the they? Who finds no guilt? The Jews? How so? The, the priests stood up and say, crucify him. Who finds no guilt in him? Pilate? Pilate questions him, finds no guilt in him. Herod. Herod brings him over and has a mock trial, finds no guilt in him, sends him back to Pilate. The Jews find no guilt in him. They sent false accusers to him. And what, did they, what was their conclusion? They sent Sadducees, Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection to question Jesus on the resurrection. And Jesus stumps them. They find no guilt in him. 
And when they had carried out, carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. Witnesses. That's, not, that's a word that we see, we've seen all throughout the book of Acts so far. They're witnesses. Again, not a mythical made-up story. I've seen it with my own eyes. If I've seen something with my own eyes, good luck convincing me otherwise. They are witnesses of that. And we bring the good, you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. And so he's, again, quoting Old Testament scripture. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Jesus did not see corruption either in the way that he lived by living a perfect life or in the way that he died. He did not see corruption. His body was not lost forever. His soul was not in a place of corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed under the law of Moses. And so we think about the studies we've had in the book of Galatians last quarter, con comparing and contrasting the book of the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament, things that were kept captive under, under the law of Moses, but now are free. <coughs> Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to all. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers. Be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Think about how that would impact the people that are listening to him. I'm telling you, but you're not believing me. And as they went out, the people begged these things, that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. Again, a, a, a very different approach, a different response from the people. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. And when we think about this stark contrast, we think about Stephen. Stephen gives them a similar message, and their reaction is to stone him. And we see a different, different response. We see the rulers of the the Jews in, the, in, in Antioch respond differently. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And so the message that they've given has, has resounded throughout the whole city. But jealousy changes things. When the Jews saw the crowds, so they see all of these people surrounding Paul and Barnabas saying, this is a, this is, look at these crowds, these are huge. How do we get that? How do we get these large crowds? Things we should think about today. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Jealousy is going to change things very, very quickly. Their attitude changes because they see crowds. They see a full building. So their attitude changes. How can we do that? Losing sight of the message that Paul delivered to them. The message of the forgiveness of sins. The Holy One not seeing corruption. We ought not to lose sight of those points. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, 
It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. A little bit of jealousy now puts them in a position where turn it to somebody else. In verse 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I've made you a light for salvation to the Gentiles. Not the Jews. Jews are included in the message. But it's not just the Jews. This is for everyone. And thanks be to God that that includes us. Gentiles, people that are not Jews. Thanks be to God that we can have that same salvation. In verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So this news of salvation spreads. This is an amazing text of, this isn't some plan that someone crafted with these 18 steps of how we seek and save the lost. They read the Bible. They, they, they had, before the Bible was written, they knew and they were given by the Holy Spirit what to say. The news of salvation. They taught that simple truth. And we have the Bible today where we can read and understand that. And that news spreads throughout the whole region. But the Jews, this is what jealousy has done. The Jews incited the devout women of high standing. They're getting people on their side. Saying, hey, why don't you come over here with me? We'll, we'll, We'll gather and we'll conspire and we'll they incited devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and they stir up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. How quickly things change. To go from a a, a people saying, if you have an encouragement, speak it. And Paul does exactly that. He stands up and he gives the encouragement. But like many of us today, they have itching ears and they don't want to hear it. They're not willing to respond to the truth that's been proclaimed. They shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Those who had believed and responded were filled with joy because of the message that's been proclaimed. I appreciate your good discussion. There are lesson handouts in the back for next week. We ought not to lose sight of a few major points from the book of Acts chapter 13. The spreading of the gospel. Paul's first missionary journey. But don't lose sight of the fact that forgiveness of sins is taught and proclaimed and that comes to me and that comes to you. Thank you for your discussion.